It's been a while since I've taken a look at a new Enterprise GPU to use in my cloud gaming server, but there's one card in particular I've been waiting for what seems like an eternity to become affordable on the secondhand market. This is the NVIDIA Tesla P100, and I think it might have just earned a permanent home in my server rack. Are you struggling to play the latest games because your PC just isn't up to the task? Is your new handheld not quite as powerful as you were hoping for? With Maximum Settings Cloud Gaming, you can get access to a powerful gaming PC in the cloud with the ability to stream a wide range of games and programs to nearly any device. Powered by a foundation of open source software like Linux Mint, Proxmox, Sunshine, and Moonlight, you'll have access to a Linux desktop, all pre-configured with Steam, Heroic Games, Lutris, and more. Virtualized gaming machines start at just $9.95 a month Canadian, or around $7.40 US, and you'll be up in gaming just a few minutes after creating your account. Or for uncompromised performance, opt for bare metal access with an AMD 7800X3D CPU and a Radeon RX 7900XT graphics card. I've demoed self-hosted cloud gaming on this channel before, but not everyone's crazy enough to have a server rack out in their garage. Get the flexibility of a cloud gaming system without the hassle of building and maintaining it yourself. Visit MaximumSettings.com or click the link down in the video description to get started today. And thanks to Maximum Settings Cloud Gaming for sponsoring today's video. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. I've taken a look at nearly a dozen different enterprise graphics cards over the years with one goal in mind. How can I use them to play games? That question isn't as crazy as it sounds. There's actually not much difference between these enterprise cards on the table and consumer GPUs that you would run in a gaming PC. In fact, most enterprise cards have direct equivalents with gaming cards, using the same GPU dies and memory configurations. The most obvious differences are usually related to cooling and power delivery, as these are meant to run inside of a server chassis. As such, cards like this are passively cooled, relying on chassis fans to force air to go through them. Also, instead of PCI Express power input, most of these cards use EPS 12 volt power, just like the CPU power rail on your motherboard. Where an 8-pin PCI Express cable is capable of delivering about 150 watts of power, an EPS connector is rated for double that up to 300 watts, meaning less cable mess inside of your servers, where space is usually at a premium. So, which GPU has my attention this week? Well, a couple months ago, one of my eBay saved searches alerted me to the NVIDIA Tesla P100, and that it had dropped below $200 and I knew I had to pick this one up. In fact, I snagged this one for just 165 bucks. Now I mentioned most enterprise GPUs share specs with gaming cards, but the Tesla P100 is a bit special. The GPU die here is the GP100, and it was a one-off piece made only for the Tesla P100 cards. While it has the same 3,584 CUDA cores as the GP102 GPU used in cards like the Titan X Pascal here, the GP100 doesn't use standard GDDR5 memory. Instead, it has 16 gigabytes of HBM2 memory baked right onto the package. That means instead of a feeble 384-bit memory bus, the P100 has an absurd 4,096-bit bus to work with. Of course, that performance didn't come cheap. When the P100 launched in June of 2016, it carried a retail price of $5,700. Testing for today is going to be pretty straightforward if you're at all familiar with my cloud gaming server series. While I do have a tutorial up for the full manual install of NVIDIA Grid, and it's worth watching if you want to know all the inner workings of making these cards work, I've also found an installer script, which I will link down below. It configures Proxmox and installs all of the drivers you'll need to get vGPU up and running inside of your own server. Since the P100 is an officially supported vGPU card, this will work with NVIDIA's official drivers without any modification needed. But the script I'm linking below does apply the vGPU unlock mod as well, enabling vGPU support on non-supported cards. The server hardware for today is the latest iteration of my cloud gaming server, running an AMD Epic Rome 7742 64-core CPU, along with 256GB of DDR4 registered ECC memory. And we'll be running the latest version of Proxmox, which at the time of filming is 8.1.4. In the past, it's actually not been terribly easy to configure vGPU profiles inside of a VM, requiring modifying the VM configuration file via SSH and then manually defining profiles into your server's memory. Now it's all in the GUI under hardware pass-through. To assign a vGPU, just click on the VM, go to hardware, and click on add PCI device. 
Click on the raw device bubble, then select the NVIDIA P100 from the drop-down list. Near the top of the window, there's a pull-down menu for MDEV type, which stands for mediated devices. These are the available vGPU profiles on your card. There are three main types of profiles to choose from, but for most use cases, you'll want to use Q types, as those are most optimized for rasterization. With 16 gigabytes of memory on the P100, we can divide the card into two eight gigabyte slices, or even further if you wish. While the memory is partitioned between the VMs, GPU power is dynamic. That means if you have two virtual machines, but only one of them is running a game or 3D application, it can utilize up to 100% of the GPU's compute power. If a second VM starts running a game, performance will automatically equalize between the two. And one last note before we get into testing, we are using the official NVIDIA client drivers for Grid inside of the Windows VM. This driver installs a virtual display, which allows for remote streaming apps like Sunshine or Parsec to function properly. Unfortunately, this virtual driver also maxes out at 60 Hz, and grid drivers have a max of 60 frames per second for rasterization. There are some ways around this limitation though. Third-party virtual display drivers or spoofing the NVIDIA PCI ID passed through to the virtual machine come to mind. But for today's video, I wanted to focus more on using this GPU to run multiple gaming VMs, not just for maximum performance. Limiting a remote VM to 60 FPS allows GPU performance to be stretched a bit more across multiple VMs, and is more in line with how I use these cards here in my house. For today's demo, I've got two Windows 11 virtual machines up and running. I tested this GPU with both VMs running at the same time, with Sunshine and Moonlight both streaming to client PCs. Benchmarks were captured with a single VM running a game, and then again with the second VM running Heaven Benchmark on a loop, representing a game running at 1080p medium settings. This should show both max performance of the card, as well as the scalability of the GPU if multiple clients are gaming at the same time. And one final note here is that even in benchmarks like 3 Mark, we are limited to a max of 60 frames per second. So scores will definitely be lower than you expected if you ran this same card on bare metal. When running Heaven Benchmark on the second VM, I've got it set to 1080p, high settings, normal tessellation, and 2x anti-aliasing, which when limited to 60 FPS sits between 40 and 60% utilization on the GPU core. Starting with 3 Mark Firestrike, we've got an overall score of 12,451 and a graphic score of 13,799 when only the first VM is in-game. With Heaven running on the second virtual machine, we see scores drop only a couple points to 11,505 and 12,200 respectively. That's a difference of only around 10%, showing some pretty impressive scaling right out of the gate. 3 Mark Time Spy is a bit more demanding, where we see about a 30% drop in performance with both VMs in-game. But to put that score into some context, that's still roughly on par with a Radeon RX 7600. So pretty decent company if you're looking for a 1080p gaming machine with two VMs running off of a single GPU. Moving into gaming, and since I know some of you are going to ask, yes, a Tesla P100 does run Crisis. What's really funny is that even all these many years later, it's still a horrible title to run at max settings, getting an average of just 56 frames per second and lows down into the teens. That may not be a terribly impressive result, but numbers hardly change when a second VM is up and running. So yes, a P100 can run Crisis, at least two of them in fact. Taking a look at some much more modern games, Red Dead Redemption 2 performs decently well with ultra textures and medium to high settings, averaging 55 frames per second and a low of 18. With the second VM running, it still proves to be playable, but the average does drop off to just 34 frames per second. Seeing as when the game first released, I played it at 25 frames per second on the Xbox One, I'll still chalk that up as a win. Red Dead is also still a very scalable game, and lowering settings can substantially improve performance if you'd rather have more FPS instead of all that eye candy activated. Probably the most impressive result of the day came with the spiritual successor of the Can It Play Crisis meme, and that's of course Cyberpunk 2077. While the P100 lacks any ray tracing features, it can still handle FSR2 upscaling, meaning 1080p at high settings is more than playable with an average of 59 frames per second and a low of just 19. Pretty impressive for one of the most demanding titles we've ever seen hit the PC. Even more impressive, with Heaven running on the second VM, our average manages to stay at 40 frames per second with the low falling slightly to just 16. While the game felt a bit clunky at 40 FPS, again with some settings tweaks, this game would be more than playable, even with multiple instances of it running. 
The rest of my testing shows that even at ultra settings, the P100 can still manage 60 frames per second for multiple clients. Doom Eternal has an average of 60 FPS and a low of 31 when running solo. With Heaven running on the second VM, we maintain the 60 FPS average, with the 0.1% low dropping to just 28. Tiny Tina's Wonderlands doesn't quite hit 60 FPS on average when running solo, managing 55 frames per second and a 1% low of 27. Again though, we only see a slight dip in performance when a second VM is running, averaging 50 FPS with a 1% low of 29. And finally, Wreckfest performed well above my expectations, even at ultra settings, with an average of 60 frames per second and a 0.1% low of 49. Heaven running on the second VM made little difference, maintaining that 60 FPS average, with lows only falling to 36 FPS. Having very recently gone back and looked at the NVIDIA Titan X Pascal in modern games, I was actually fully prepared to be let down by the Tesla P100. While I'm sure the P100 would still struggle with ultra settings in games like Cyberpunk or Starfield, at moderate settings, it should easily be able to not only play these games at reasonable frame rates, but even potentially more than one instance at the same time. For $165, I've now got one GPU in my server rack that can run two 1080p games to any device that I want to play on. That can mean a Raspberry Pi 400, an inexpensive Android handheld, or even just an old PC or Nook that doesn't have the option of installing a graphics card. But reviewing this card and thinking back to the previous, what, 18 videos in my cloud gaming server series, I'm really curious to how the P100 stacks up against all the other cards I've benchmarked previously. I'm actually going to start working on a full top to bottom tier list of how these cards work in vGPU and if they're worth your money today with the modern pricing. Meanwhile, if you're interested in picking up an NVIDIA Tesla P100 for yourself, I will have eBay affiliate links down in the video description. Clicking on those does send a small kickback my way and helps me continue making content like this on used gear. I'll also have links to my other cloud gaming server videos as well as the latest guides for setting it up yourself. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. And if you like the content you see on this channel and want to help support me in what I do, head on over to craftcomputing.store, pick yourself up one of our nucleated pint glasses. We've also got a couple brand new coasters up, including an Intel Xeon 2667 V0, the CPU that started my channel, and this beer installation disc. This is honestly one of the favorite things I've made yet. And that's going to do it for me in this one. Thank you all so much for watching. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, everyone. Ah, that's a really good rat. Beer for today is from Block 15 Brewing out of Corvallis, Oregon. It is the Charmed Life Irish Style Red Ale, clocking in at 5%. Low on bitterness, but big on flavor, this medium-bodied red ale offers a pleasant multi nose with a subtle caramel flavor that balances with a clean finish. What a charmed life indeed. Oh, I can smell the malt from here. Ooh. That's going to be really good. <laughs> I was looking forward to this, but now I'm really excited. Charmed Life Irish Style Red. This is a darn good red. Uh, this is from Corvallis, Oregon, Block 15. Uh, usually here in the Northwest, we get what I like to call Northwest Style Red Ales. We get hopped red ales. This is a traditional, multi, rich, thick actual Irish style red. It just happens to be brewed in the Northwest. I can't get over how good that smell is too. It's like fresh toffee. It's like fresh saltwater toffee. I like this one. We, we don't get a lot of super malty beverages brewed up here in the Northwest. So when we do get one, it gets all of my adoration. Pick this one up if you find it.